All right, today we're going to be talking about crown fires. Now, if you don't know what a crown fire is, it's one of the most intense things that can happen in the world of wildfire, and it's where your surface fire mixes up into the canopy, and then you start to have a fire within the treetops. Now, that's kind of a general definition, but as I learned today while I was reading Fire in California's Ecosystems, there's actually three different kinds of crown fires, three different stages that you could have. So these three stages are going to be passive, active, and independent. And I would say it goes up in intensity between those three. So in your passive stage, this is going to be where you have your surface fire burning, and then maybe it's a low wind situation or you just have your canopy is pretty close to the ground. So the surface fire is able to mix up into the canopy and you get individual trees torching, but it's not exactly jumping from tree to tree. It's not one of those crown fires that's moving throughout the crown. It's more individual trees torching. So there's a few things that can promote this kind of activity. I already kind of gave away one or maybe even two of them. First one is going to be how much heat you have on your surface fire. That makes sense. The more heat you have, the more likely it is the fire is going to go up into the canopy because that's most likely you're going to have taller flames. So you have to have heat and then that heat also has to get into the canopy somehow. And that's either going to happen from the flames being tall enough to just touch the canopy themselves. That'll especially take place if you have a low canopy. So that's another important factor out there, the height of the canopy. So that one's also very intuitive. The lower it is, the more likely it is you get a crown fire. So you could have the heat spreading from your fire by the flames actually touching the canopy or just the heat being either radiated or convected into the canopy. And then once that happens, the moisture will start to evaporate out of the canopy first, some of your fuels there. And then once the moisture is gone, then the temperature of your fuels is going to increase until it reaches its ignition temperature. And then at that point, the canopy can catch on fire and you get the torching on your tree. But the main thing I want to point out here is that this isn't one of the fires that moves from tree to tree. So that's why it's your passive crown fire. Where you are moving from tree to tree is what you would call an active crown fire. So this, once again, is more likely when you have a lot of heat on your surface fire below, lower canopy heights, and then this one is much more likely if you have high winds because that's going to push the fire from tree to tree. And then intuitively, it's also going to happen more if you have trees closer together. If you have trees farther apart, you still might get some embers burning and being tossed from tree to tree, maybe in your passive crown fire. But in an active fire, the closer those trees are, the more likely it is that the fire is able to jump into the neighbor tree and then keep that fire going. But what's the key part about an active crown fire is that the fire burning in the canopy and the surface fire below are connected. So this sounds like a pretty intense situation because you imagine how intense just a surface fire could be. And you imagine how intense a fire burning within the treetops would be. Now imagine that that fire is connected so it's almost just one giant flame. And I would love to know what some of the flame heights and flame lengths could be on some of these active crown fires that we have. In some cases, if it's going up into the canopy, you might have flame lengths that are 70 or 80 feet or maybe even more than that. that. That's something I definitely want to look up. So we've gone over passive crown fires, active crown fires. Passive is individual torching. Active is surface fire connected to the canopy fire moving through the trees. And finally, you have your independent crown fire. This one's pretty well named. You could probably already guess what I'm about to say. But that's where your surface fire jumps up into the canopy. But now the fire just starts moving within the canopy on its own. And it's detached from the surface fire down below. And you could say this would be your most intense wildfire situation when it comes to crown fires. Because it's going to happen when you have very high winds 
and those trees are very closely packed together. And then it could also happen in very steep terrain that could make this more likely because the flames would be tilted towards the trees above them instead of all that heat just being a, just being wasted rising straight up if you were on flat terrain. So with an independent fire, the fire in the crown is moving faster than the surface fire below. This makes sense if you think about what the winds are doing. Your winds are going to be faster up on the treetops because down below some of that wind is being blocked. It's kind of like in a city at the top of skyscrapers it, you could have very windy conditions but then down on the streets you have so many buildings and stuff blocking the winds that it might not actually be that windy. So <clears throat> in this example the fire, so an independent fire, it's moving through the canopy not connected to the surface fire below and this is probably the rarest of the crown fires that you could get because it is the most intense. Now one thing that I do need to clarify as I said this is more likely if you have very windy conditions in or steep terrain but it is possible to get an independent crown fire with low wind conditions and that's going to happen if you have a very unstable atmosphere so unstable, basically just think of that as lots of vertical motion in the atmosphere or vertical mixing. And that's where you would have what's called a plume dominated fire. This is something that we'd studied at San Jose State Fire Weather Research Laboratory. We would drive up to fires, two F1 or F-350s. One of them had a radar on the back. One of them had a LIDAR on the back. We'd point them at the plume. And kind of what we were trying to figure out and collect data for that we could later plug into our wildfire models is how the fire is creating its own weather. And a lot of times if you have very unstable conditions, you have a lot of rising motion within your plume, there's a lot of energy moving around, and that can lead to very extreme fire conditions on the ground. So that's our crown fires, very intense situations right there. What it does remind me of is a situation that we want to avoid. <coughs> Excuse me. Still getting over about a two-week sickness, as you've probably been able to tell from my videos the last two weeks, where I'm talking about wildfire, and I think it was last Thursday. I I sound like Phoebe in that one episode of Friends, where she's trying to sing, and her nose is just completely clogged up. So I am improving, but slowly. Um, so what this reminded me of as I'm learning about crown fires is the fact that we want to avoid crown fires happening. It's much better to just have a surface fire, clear out some of the surface fuels, than to go up into the canopy and basically just wipe out everything within that entire wildfire area. So that's one reason acres burned isn't always a good metric. You could potentially have a much larger fire acres burned wise that does far less damage because maybe it's just a surface fire whereas you could have a smaller fire that is maybe one of your active crown fires where everything burns and then it's actually much more damage than just the maybe surface fire that could have could be actually beneficial now that ties in to what again this reminded me of i've gone off on a couple little tangents here and it was the prescribed fires that we've had in Santa Cruz County over the last couple of days. We had some poor air quality in the Santa Cruz Mountains today, and we had people calling into the station about, oh, there's smoke, is there a wildfire, how unhealthy is it? And at times, we did have unhealthy air quality up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. But what I kept emphasizing when I was talking about this during my weather forecast is that it might not seem great right now. It's like, oh, we put fire on the ground on purpose and now we have poor air quality. Like, why are we doing that? But it's one of those things where you do maybe what's hard in the short run for what's good in the long run instead of kicking a can down the road, making things worse for your future self. So in a prescribed burn, what they're doing is they're clearing out a lot of the surface fuels so that fuels don't accumulate and get into the, one of those situations where you could have a crown fire because that's also what's going to make a crown fire more likely. I talked about how the height of the canopy 
or the moisture of the fuels within the canopy, but it's also important how many fuels you have leading up to that canopy. You have what's called ladder fuels. If it goes from like grass to brush to small trees up into your big trees, a surface fire can just light each of those and then it's almost just like falling like dominoes, except it's fire spreading up into your crown. So when you do prescribed burns, you clear out some of those lower fuels so then if a fire comes through there, it's not going to have that much heat later on because there won't be as much fuel. If it doesn't have as much heat, it's much less likely that the fire goes up into the canopy. That means it's much less likely that it turns into one of these extreme wildfire situations. And that's much better for us in terms of our property and our lives. And I'm sure it makes firefighters job a lot easier out there as well. And even if you were just concerned about air quality, it also is better for that because what's better to have a prescribed fire on conditions that are favorable. Today wasn't that hot, wasn't windy, decent amount of moisture out there. So they were able to put some fire on the ground, clear out some of those fuels in a safe manner, and it just burned the surface fuels. Versus if we kick the can down the road 10 years, the the fuels build up and accumulate, and then it's very hot one day, very dry one day, very windy, and you have maybe a, an ignition, and that starts a fire, and now it not only burns the surface fuels, but it turns into a crown fire, and it burns the trees as well. So what's going to lead to more smoke? If you have a slow burning, not very intense surface fire, or if you have an extreme wildfire situation where everything is burning. Obviously, that one's going to lead to a lot more smoke, a lot worse air quality, and just more unhealthy, dangerous conditions for humans. So it's all about doing what is right right now, but even if it is maybe harder, it's having that sacrifice in the present moment for what's good in the long run. So that's a big part of the reason that Prescribed burning is one of the key things that we should be doing to improve the wildfire situation in California and get us closer toward living with fire. So hopefully you learned something about crown fire or prescribed burning throughout the course of this video, and thanks for watching.